to give you a copy of God's Word. We're going to meet together in the book of Numbers this morning. The children's church is leaving the building this time. We have Numbers chapter 6 this morning. We look at the Word of God. We help you all out. Start the book. Start the beginning. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Y'all know where Leviticus is at. Y'all read there all the time. I know. You know, nobody reads Leviticus. <laughs> And then Numbers, about four chapters, or four books in, you'll find the book of Numbers. And go to the sixth chapter. We're going to look into the Word of God. Amen. I still hear a few pages turning. Everybody there, amen? Amen. amen. If not, give me a minute. All right. Let's get reading in verse 22 of Numbers chapter 6, and we're going to read down through verse 27. Um, you probably you probably heard this before, but we're going, to, we're going to talk about it this morning. In verse 22, it said, And the Lord spake to Moses, saying, speaking to Aaron and to his son, saying, On the wise you shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel. And I will bless them. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that we might be able to come before your throne of grace. God, we come with such great expectations today because you are a great God. We thank you for being with us in our song service this morning. And I pray, God, that you would open our hearts to receive everything that you have for us. And I pray you would leave us out of ourselves. Fill us with your spirit, God. We might be able to rightly divide the word of truth. That this word would go forth and accomplish everything that you desire to do in this service today. That we might be able to leave here saying it was good to have come to the house of the Lord. I pray you'll touch your servant. I pray that you'll help me to be the effective communicator of the gospel that I so richly desire to be. And I might be able to do the perfect work of God. We love you so much. We thank you. We praise you. We ask all of these favors and blessings in Christ's true and holy name we do pray. And all God's people say it. Amen. 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 You know, if I was reading that, let me back up just a minute. I, I was just thinking about something. We were singing that song, I'm going to see the king. Yeah, I got thinking about a fever ship. I don't know where that came from. But anyway, I ain't going to charge you no extra for this. But I got thinking about my fever ship going to see the king. And, and you know, sometimes it, it, it is a burden to come to church. Sometimes it's a burden to, to get going to, to serve in the Lord. But, but when my fever ship got there, he was a little burdened down. But when he got there, he got a blessing. And we'll, I don't know. We, you may hear that again. You may get to, you may get to hear that preach sometimes. I don't know if God just put that on my heart. But anyway, let's get back to our to our text at hand this morning. And that will be Numbers chapter 6. And we look at this passage of Scripture. This is, a, <clears throat> this is a mandate or a commandment from God to Moses and Aaron. Now, Aaron was the, the, priestly, the, the priestly group. Him and his son, they were the priests. Now, as we begin to understand this, this was God's way of telling them how to, how to pronounce blessing upon his people. Now, I just really got to read this. It's kind of interesting in the intro here, but it's kind of interesting in verse 25. It talks about that the Lord make his face to, to shine upon thee. And he fixes his face upon us that he shines upon us. And I think about that. I think about how God fixes his face on us. And I think about our face sometimes. You know, we, I think we all, well, most everybody, let's just say that, does pretty good about controlling our mouth. And not saying the things that we shouldn't say and saying the things that we do. And sometimes we get agitated and aggravated. And, you know, sometimes we, we do slip up and say things maybe we shouldn't. But here's the thing. Here's what we, I really believe, and I don't know, maybe just me. But I have a really, really hard time controlling my facial expression sometimes. Amen. Is anybody with me? Anybody picking up what I'm putting down there? Okay, I'm glad I'm not alone. I'm glad I'm not the only one that, can, that, that, that just cannot get my facial expressions in check. Okay, so I, I think about that. And, you know, we get that look sometimes. You know, we get something that we say, and we're like, hmm, we get, get that, 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 that stink eye, you know, going on there. And, and that says a lot. Our face says a lot lot about what we're thinking. Um, and you know, just a, a facial expression can be a positive thing, it can be a negative, negative thing. I remember when I was a kid, 
play sports. I remember always searching the crowd, looking for somebody up there that, that would, you know, give me some encouragement, just a just a smile, just a nod, just a, a little bit of encouragement. I still I think that's still going. Today, even students today, I've seen them playing basketball and playing baseball, football. They're, they're searching the crowd, looking for someone to give them some encouragement. Just that little bit of a nod, just that little bit of a smile, and whatever, you know, that facial expression goes a long way. It means a lot. And I think that's still very real and very relevant in the day that, that we live in. Because those kids were looking for approval. They were looking for something from somebody. They were looking for that attaboy from the stands. But I think as we begin to honestly think about it, it never goes away. I, I, I really think that it's kind of like built into our DNA that that's something that, that we want. We desire that facial recognition. We desire that approval. Words are powerful, but that, that, that face, that, that what we see on someone's face, it says it first. Before a word is ever uttered, that facial expression. And I've learned, you know, through 20 years of preaching, I, I'm just going to tell you, there's certain people in the crowd that I just don't look at y'all. Because I'm looking at, I'm looking for somebody that's leaned in, that's got a, looks like they got a desire to hear the word of God, that looks like they got a desire to be engaged in the word of God. And if you want, let me just say this, if you're sitting out there looking like you constipated and sucked on the limb before you got here, I'm probably not going to look at you. I'm sorry. So if I, if I don't to look at you, just say, keep that in mind. But, but I'm just saying, from my, it just does something to me when I see somebody look like that. I think we all, all come in the house of the Lord with a smile on our face and joy in our heart. And if we can just get that into our spirit, I just wonder why people sit in church and be saying I mean, I could be sad at the house, but I come to church to be you know, joyful in the Lord. And I, I don't know. But anyway, so I, that's neither here nor there. But you know, you get messed up looking at the wrong people. And, you know, from, from this vantage point, somebody just don't know what you look like. Bless y'all. But anyway. But I, you know, I gravitate to those people. They are engaged. They do look like they are. are, are in, in, you know, engaged in what I'm saying. So it, it matters what we do with our face. That, that's the point I'm trying to make there. It really does matter what our facial expression. It goes a long way of saying what's in our heart. It goes a long way of saying, you know, I think about facial expression. Anyone have your facial expression thing that you look on the iPhone and open up your iPhone? Any of y'all got that? Any of y'all have trouble with that? Anybody? You have trouble with that? Okay, I, I just wonder. But sometimes I just wonder how that takes place. I just wonder if maybe we take that picture when we first get up in the morning. You know? And then as we kind of put on our game face and put on our, 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 get our hair fixed and some of you ladies get your makeup on and then all of a sudden you struggle with that thing. It's like you don't know who you are. It's trying to figure out, you know, what happened there. That don't, that don't look like the same person that took that thing. It, like the hair might be a little different or something. I, I got something that'll help Did you know that there is an alternate ID on there? You know, you can actually put several different ID, like it, it's really popular back in COVID. You can take <clears throat> like a little mask on. You can have one without a mask, one with a mask, and it would it would differentiate between the two. There's a setting on your phone. I, I just learned that. We'll charge you no extra for that either. But anyway, there is a, set, a setting on your phone called alternate ID, and I think sometimes that is very real and very relevant in the day and age that we live in. That we, as not, if we're not careful, we'll have an alternate ID. We will have an ID here at church. We'll have an ID at church. We'll have an ID with this group of people. We'll have a different ID with this other group of people over here. And you know what we're doing? We're looking for <coughs> we're looking for them to give us approval. We're trying to do what we need to do to get approval from this group so we act this way. When we come to church, we, we act another way to get approval from this group. And then as we go through life, we just find ourselves and, and all of a sudden we're really confused and we're as messed up as a chameleon in a bag of skittles and we don't know what to do. And here we are. I'll get that later. But anyway, here we are trying to figure all this out. And I think so many times if we can just get to the point in our life where we say, okay, I'm going to fix my face. On God. Amen. And I don't trust Him because He has fixed His faith on me. So as we begin to we begin to really look at this, we've seen this passage of scripture that Aaron he's got a mandate from God and he's got a he's got the the word from God to be able to bless God's people. And, and I don't, you know I just think we're all looking for 
someone. Someone. That their face will just light up when they see us. And if you think about that, you can look all through the world and you're not going to find someone that their face is going to light up every time they see you. I don't want to bust your bubble, but there's going to be times that their face will light up when they see you because they long to see you. Or there may be times that they want something and their face lights up and says, oh yeah, I need to talk to you. You know, you get that. And sometimes when you make a mistake, you fall and you fail, you come up short. Yeah, they don't, they don't, they don't, their face don't light up then. But the good news of the gospel is we serve a God that no matter who we are, no matter what we bring to the table, no matter how many times we fall or how many times we fail, or how many good deeds we do, his face is the same. He always looks at us. And he looks at us in a, in a way that is that is saying yes, acknowledging us for who we are, and that we are to wretched sinners outside the grace of God. But what happened on the cross has made a difference in our life. And as he begins to see that, he don't see us as who we are. He sees us behind and under the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he sees that and he says, they're mine. And I'm well pleased with them. And as we begin to really put that into perspective, if you're, we're really looking for something in our life, we're looking for somebody that's looking at us and sets our, their face on us and will overlook our insecurity, our idiosyncrasies, whatever we may have. And we're looking for somebody that will do that each and every time. Not one day and not the next, but every single time that's consistent. That's God. That's the God that we serve. So when we think about that, you know, as we look at this passage of Scripture today, the, our Scripture today tells us this. We get, we get affirmation in the, in the Word of God. Verse 25 says it this way, The Lord made His face to shine upon thee and to be gracious unto thee. He made His face to shine upon thee. It didn't say when we're doing good, when we're walking right, when we're living right, when we're doing all the things that we're supposed to do, when we're coming to church every Sunday and meeting all the requirements and coming to Sunday school every Sunday and doing everything that we feel like we need to do, then and only then is God's face shining upon us. No. It's all the time. Because He loves us. He cares for us. And I think as we reaffirm with that scripture there, and you know, sometimes I think we just need to quit acting like we got it all figured out. We just need to quit acting like we got it all together. Because God knows we don't. He knows better. He knows we don't have it figured out. And I think, you know, we need to stop praying and bargaining with God. And not stop praying, but we need to stop praying those prayers that we're bargaining with God. Because here, let's just be real. We don't have any chips, church. We don't have nothing to bargain with. I don't even know why we think that we can bargain with God. Because we have absolutely nothing to bargain with. Amen. But we're here we come to God. God, if you'll do this, I'll do this. And God knows our heart. God knows that our intentions may be good. But the flesh is weak, church. We'll fail miserably sometimes. We, we might do that a time or two, but we can make a vow, I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that. But how many New Year's resolutions have you made in camp? I mean, let's just be real. We, we fall and fail every year. And we do simple things. We're going to do this. And we're going to lose weight. And we're going to do whatever. And you know, if we begin to think about that, if we can't keep simple things, how are we going to keep big things? We can. That's the reason Jesus had to come and die for us on the cross. That we could take our sin dead and lay it at the feet of Jesus and it be covered with the blood of Jesus. That's the reason He had to come. We couldn't keep the commandments. There was no way that God knew that. And I think the only thing that we got to do, the only thing we got to offer God is we come broken to the end of ourselves. And we just say, God, God, this is who I am. And just be real with God. You know, I, I think about a baby. You know, you begin to think about how babies change the lives of people, how babies change the, the injury of people. You know, you can take the, the hardest heart in the world and you can hand that person a baby. Their whole visage vis, will change. Can you stop this morning? But they, they will change all around. They'll, they, their voice will get higher. They'll get a few octaves higher. They'll be saying little coochie coo stuff like that, you know, that they normally wouldn't say. But I mean, you begin to think about how a baby would change people. Now, what's so interesting about a baby? Why does that do that? This baby, uh, what, can they do anything for you? No. I mean, they're pretty much helpless, right? I mean, they're pretty much dependent upon somebody else. And as I begin to think about that, I begin to think about our life. It's sometimes we come to God and we just say, God, I need you to fix it like this and fix it like that. Or God, I need this in my life or that in my life. And God says, no, you don't. But here's the interesting thing about it. If we could just come to God like a child, Childlike faith. If we could just come to him and say, God, I'm pretty much helpless. I'm pretty much 
be out of resources. I pretty much don't have anything. I've messed myself and I need cleaning up. God, that's just pretty much how it is with a baby. And I think if we go to understand that we can come to God the same way and say, God, I'm just a mess. Yes. I'm just a big old mess. Amen. But God, I know you can fix that. You can clean my life up. You can help me to overcome that. And I think if we begin to really look at it, we just need to quit bargaining with God. Quit, quit coming and acting like we got it all together. So we, we, we can't. We don't have it together at all. So God looks at us like this, and he, that's when he begins to want to help us. That's when his face begins to shine on us. And, and that, he begins to fix things, and he begins to bless us. And that's what this whole passage of Scripture is about. It's to, it's to Aaron and his sons, the priest, and he's telling them, he said, listen, I want you to be, <coughs> I'm commissioning you, God is commissioning him through Moses, to go and bless God's people. Now, God gives me some instructions here as we begin to read this passage of Scripture because, you know, sometimes I think that we have the wrong image of God. And if we have the wrong image of God, it will have the wrong effect on how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about other people. Because here's the thing. Let's just think about it this way. If you feel like God is annoyed with you, if you feel like God is aggravated, agitated, or annoyed with you, you know what that will do? It will cause you to be aggravated, agitated, and annoyed with yourself. And if we're agitated, aggravated, and annoyed with ourselves, you know what's going to happen the first time somebody gets around us and the first time somebody comes out in our way that's not perfect? We're going to get agitated, aggravated, and annoyed with them too. Amen. So if we can see God in the right perspective, God will show us us in the right perspective, and then he'll teach us how to love others in the right perspective. Now, that's not easy to do sometimes, <clears throat> but I think if we get the right imagery of God, we see ourselves differently, and ultimately we see others differently. So as we begin to put all of that into perspective, it's really, really dangerous to see, you know, in God incorrectly. Because if we see him incorrectly, we will not only have the wrong image, but we will misrepresent God to other people. I'm going to give you some scripture to kind of back that up. But I want to make some points here. My first point is, there is a danger in misrepresenting God. Now, Numbers teaches us how to, God's teaching the people here how to correctly represent God. And as he goes through this book of Numbers, I mean, they, you know, you got to understand, <coughs> given the law and all the priests and stuff in Leviticus, they've come out of the bondage of the Egyptians in Exodus. They went after they jacked it up and messed it up in Ex and, uh, Genesis. So as we see this, when they get the number, here they are. They're trying to find the correct representation of God, the correct uh, imagery of God to be able to share that with these people. So if you, if you will, look with me in Numbers chapter 10. That's just a few pages over. Numbers chapter 10, you don't have to turn far to find it. It's on page 181 in my Bible. I don't know what page it's on in your Bible. But let's look at verses 7 through 12 really quick. Numbers chapter 10, verses 7 through 12. And this is what it says. Uh, when the congregation... <coughs> excuse me. I'm not sure I got it right. Yeah. All right. When the congregation is gathered together, you shall blow, and you shall not sound the alarm for the sons of Aaron. Shall blow the trumpets, and they shall be able to find the ordinance of your generations. And if the light, if the if you go to war, the land against the enemy oppresses you, then you shall blow the alarm of the trumpets, and remember the Lord before you, and you shall be saved from your enemies. So now, as you begin to see this, they begin to see God for who He was, a God that was able to come and overcome their enemies. A God that was able to meet them at their point of need. Now, as you begin to really begin to see, they understood who God was, and they, they realized this trumpet was symbolic of that. So they, as they begin to understand the, the way of God, they begin to understand the correct representation of God, everybody began to follow them. Now, if you remember another story in the Bible, there was a time when Moses was being just really battered by the, the children of Israel. There was no water in the land. There was no water for them to drink. And Moses had gotten aggravated, agitated, and annoyed by the people. Yeah. Now, as you begin to understand this, you begin to see that God told Moses, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go, and I want you to speak to the rock. I know that story. I remember the story. He couldn't get in the promised land. Why? Because he smoked the rock. Well, as you begin to understand that, we begin to see that because Moses was ag aggravated, agitated, and annoyed, he looked at him and he said, you bunch of rebels? He was aggravated. He said, why are you this way? He said, let me just show you what I'm going to do. And he, he smoked the rock. 
twice. Now, as we begin to look at this passage of Scripture, we begin to see that he blatantly misrepresented God because the Apostle Paul says in the book of 1 Corinthians, he says this, that that rock was symbolic of Jesus Christ. And as we begin to see this, he blatantly misrepresented God, who God was, and God says, I want to let the people go into the land, but you can't go, Moses. You're not going to be able to enter into the promised land. You can see it from a distance, from afar, but you're not going in. And as we begin to understand that, there is a danger in really misrepresenting God. Oh, sometimes we need to, to do that and learn how to fix our face because sometimes just walking through life, we do this so <clears throat> unintentional. But we're walking around and we're, we're joined heirs of Christ Jesus. We are a royal ambassador. We are a royal priesthood. And I think as we begin to represent God, and we walk around with a scowl on our face, we walk around with people looking at us like, what in the world is wrong with them? Are we, tr are we truly representing the image of God? I don't believe God's sitting in heaven with a scowl on his face, church. Amen. I don't believe he's sitting up there with, with, looking sad, looking depressed. Amen. I really believe he's sitting up there high and lifted up, joyful and, and excited about what's going on in heaven. But not only that, joyful and excited that we can have abundant life here in this world. And he, he desires that for us. And if God can be happy, we can be happy because he has the resources to make us happy. But we're trying to be happy in and of ourselves. We're trying to fix ourselves. And God says, if you'll just fix your face on me, I'll fix your problem. I'll fix what's going on. I might not fix it the way you want it fixed, the way you think it ought to be fixed, but I can bring you joy. I can bring you hope. I can bring you peace. I can bring you comfort. I can bring you what you need. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. And it really, if you think about this passage of Scripture, if God had not told Aaron that Moses did, we wouldn't have that song. You know the song. The Lord bless thee, keep thee, make his face shine upon thee, be gracious to you. You remember that song? Y'all need me to sing it. No, y'all just saying, okay. But we wouldn't have that song. And we think about that. And we begin to think that how this scripture is so real and so relevant. And I think there's something that's really repetitive in the scripture that I just want to, I want to show you there. And as we read this, let me get back to, my, to the scripture here. Yeah, there we go. It said, Then the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Speaking to Aaron and his sons, all the wise ye shall bless the people, the children of Israel, saying unto them. Three things right here in these next three verses that really just stuck out to me. The Lord bless and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious to me. The Lord lifted up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Now as we begin to see that, y'all see the common denominator there? Y'all kind of, y'all seeing what I'm seeing there? The Lord. That's big L. If you was here on Wednesday night a few weeks ago, a few months ago, you know what that means. What does anybody remember what the Lord with the big L that is? Yahweh. Jehovah. Yahweh. So as we begin to see this, this is Yahweh, the Lord, speaking. And this is what Yahweh is going to do. He is going to bless and keep thee, make his face, fix his face upon them, and he's going to lift up their countenance, set his face towards their countenance, and he's going to make give them peace. <coughs> so as we see this, this is the same God that met with Moses at the burning bush. And he told Moses, he said, listen, I want you to go to Pharaoh, and I want you to tell him to let my people go, and you tell the people that you're there to get them, to bring them out of the bondage of Egypt. And he said, I want you to go and tell them this. Now as we begin to understand this, this is Moses, he's thinking, okay, who am I that I should go? I can't even talk plain. I'm stuttering. And finally, he says those famous words. He said, well, well, God, I'll go. But who am I going to tell him what sent me? And it's interesting what God said. Jehovah said this. Yahweh said this. He said, you tell them that I am that I am sent thee. Now, why did, why did he say that? I think what God is trying to communicate to Moses and get Moses to communicate to the people that are in the bondage of Egypt there, I really believe he's just saying, you know, I can tell them, I can tell him to tell them that I am their life. But I'm also their strength. And I can tell him to tell them that I am their provider. But I'm more than their provider. I'm, just, I'm not just their provider, I'm their protector. And I can tell him to tell them that I'm their refuge 
Oh, but I'm more than that. I'm their shield. Oh, I can tell them to tell him to tell them that I'm their healer. Oh, but I'm so much more than that. I I just need him to tell them that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except by me. And you know, I begin to think about God trying to get this communicated to Moses there, and he just kind of summed it up. He said, "Let me just condense this right now." He said, "I am, I am, I, I am the I am that I am. Whatever you need." I am. Whatever you come up against, I am. And as we begin to really, you know, get excited about this and think about this, someone ought to just, you know, just get excited and praise the Lord because no matter what changes in our life, what wilderness that we walk through in our life, what obstacles we come against, and we've got a God that is no matter what we're up against, He is I am. He's our provider when we need provision. He's our strength when we're weak. He's our joy when we're downtrodden. He is our peace when we just don't have peace at all in our mind. But I think if we can just get a hold of that and know that no matter what we're up against, we have a God that is there and He is I am of I am. Now, that's what He told Moses. He said, you go and you tell them that. But I think as we begin to see this, Moses needed this. Wait a minute. Maybe that's the reason that Moses got to see God face to face. You ever thought about that? You know, the Bible says that all the other prophets had to hear God through visions and dreams. But he said, when I speak to Moses, I'm going to speak to him like a friend, like a, like a man, face to face. That's how we're going to speak to Moses. And as we begin to really look at that, I think you've got to really back up in Moses' life to understand what Moses has been missing. Remember Moses? Remember how he, how he started? Remember he was born and first two years of his life, what, what happened to Moses? He was hid. They, they was hiding Moses because Pharaoh had, had sent people out to kill all the little baby boys because they was trying to <coughs> do away with. Excuse me. They was trying to do away with the baby boy because they was intimidated and, and, and fearful of them because they were going to grow up to, to be a, a ruler over them. They, they thought. So as we begin to see this, Moses was hid the first two years of his life, and Moses. Really didn't get any face to face contact with anybody. He didn't get that affirmation. He didn't get that instruction that he needed as a child. He, he here he was. He, he was put in this little basket. He was floated down the Nile. And, you know the, 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 the alligators eat up a bunch of kids. They just throw them out there. The crocodile throws them for the alligators and the crocodiles to eat. There was a lot of them just slaughtered in that day. But Moses, he was put in this basket. He was, went down there, and Pharaoh's daughter was bathing there. We know the story. She picked him up and took him back to his mom, and, and the mom took care of him. He was raised up there in the palace, and, and, and I, I begin to think about that. You know, all through this. When Moses got out of that palace, Moses is probably thinking, you know, I was rejected as a child. I didn't get what some of these other kids got. I didn't get that face-to-face -face <coughs> approval of a parent. But I think as we begin to really look at that, I think at some point in Moses' life, he realized that he was not rejected, that he was protected. It was not because God rejected him. It was because God had protected him by putting him in this little basket and, and putting a pitch on the inside and the outside and floating him down the river and getting him to Pharaoh's daughter. She turned him back over to his mom. And as we begin to see this, sometimes in our life, we go through things and we think that God is far away from us. We feel like God has rejected us. And we feel like that we have been had to do this all on our own. But if we'll really look back, I just wonder if there's somebody that can praise God this morning and say, you know, God, if you had to send me on that journey, if you had to send me that way, and I thought you rejected me, I thought you had turned your back on me, I thought you had let me hung out to dry, and you had just forgotten about me. But God, now I see the, prote the protection that was on me. I see that that was on my life, that anointing that you put on my life. Because anybody else who would have killed in that situation, but here I am standing today, knowing beyond a shadow of doubt that it was the protection of God that brought me through this thing. Well, if we see this, we begin to understand that sometimes we got to get the correct imagery of God. Sometimes we get this, <clears throat> we speculate, and we, we kind of think about, okay, well, God, you're, you're just, because I'm not hearing from you <clears throat> the way I need to hear from you, God, you're not doing what I want you to do, and God, you're rejecting me. You are rejecting me, and no, that's not that at all. 
I think there's areas in our life that we feel we've been rejected by God. But we look back, we see where that sovereign, sovereign God was God in our pathway the whole time. Yeah. In places that others would have died. The next thing I want to point out is we see that the Lord. We see that was a common denominator in there. But then there's something else that we see here. <clears throat> we said we see that the Lord bless me and keep me. Now bless. That's an interesting word. I think if we look at our second point in this passage of Scripture, we see that if God has a default, it's blessing. But think about this for just a moment. Before there was original sin in the Garden of Eden, what came before the original sin? The original blessing. Because God placed them in the garden that was perfectly prepared for them and gave them everything they needed to be sustained and taken care of in that garden. So before the original sin was the original blessing. That's the God, that's who God is for us. He has a desire to bless us. He has a desire to meet the needs that's in our life and bring blessings into our life. But we got to understand that is his default. But we get blessings. We just get that really confused sometimes. Yeah, I think as we begin to see this, everybody has this, this mixed opinion about blessings. And contrary to what some preacher may have screamed at you one day, that you're going to bust hell wide open. I just need you to understand that, that God, that is not necessarily what God has intended. Not, that's not at all what God has intended for your life. God intended for your life that none should perish but all should come to repentance. Yeah. So as we begin to understand that and try to put that into perspective, we begin to see that God's default is blessing. Now, He never, never do we see God ordain a priest and say, I want you to go out and pronounce curses upon the people. Amen. What did he say? I want you to go out and, and, and ordain, to be ordained to pronounce blessings upon the people. Amen. Now there was a time that God said, told them when they went into the land of, uh, of Canaan there, he said, this is what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to bless those that bless you, curse those that curse you. But he never told the priest, he said, I want you to go out and pronounce curses on the people. Never. We don't see that. So God's default is blessing. Now, as we begin to see that, we've got to understand that word, that word blessing. We begin to look at it, and I think as we begin to think about that word, we have, we have watered that word down. Because as we really look at that word, what, what do we say that? Like, bless you, and use that word bless. So many times, let's just think about it. When someone sneezes, oh, bless you. And this is what gets me. Sometimes I can go, <laughs> and somebody, bless you. Don't let your bless you be, be louder than my sneeze. <laughs> I don't know why people do that. I can sneeze over here, and somebody from the back and go, bless you. That, that's so watered down, church. That is not what that word was intended for. We have reduced that down. And I think we've reduced it to a financial thing. Oh, yeah, you know. I need to be blessed by God financially. I need, I need this. If somebody come up to you, they'll, they'll give you a little bit of money and say, you know, the Lord has put it on my heart to bless you. And they'll put it on, praise the Lord, thank you. When did he put it on your heart? Because I really needed this three weeks ago. That's what the lot bill was doing. You know, sometimes we just really get that in our spirit. And that's, that's the blessings of God. And it comes from, from something financial. And I'm not saying that you can't be blessed financially, but I, that is certainly not the intent of that word as we go back and really look that word up and we'll talk about it in just a minute. But I think it, as Christians and church people, we, we've learned to even kind of criticize people with that word. You say, what do you mean? And you know how we say, she's a little bit homely. Bless her heart. <laughs> He's a little bit slow. Bless his heart. You know, we, we use that word so loosely, so loosely that we begin to just use it, take it completely out of context. And I think if we begin to really understand what that Hebrew word means, we got to really go and understand that it means to come down or to kneel. Now, if we put that in perspective, if we put that into context, here's the imagery that follows through with that word. We have a God that has come down that has knelt down and that has wrapped himself in flesh. And I think as we begin to understand this, we can't just limit the blessings to a new car. I know you want a new car. I think we can't, you know, just you know, reduce the blessings to, you know, something financial, something monetary. 
You know, and I think even healing, we, we look at that, well, God has, has blessed me and He's healed my body. We want that. We desire that. But I think the only time that we really want to praise God is when we get some financial blessing or some monetary blessing or when we get that healing that we think we need and we get a prayer answered. But if we really look at that word in the proper perspective there, we've got to understand that the blessing is the fact that God has already came down. He has put on human skin. He's lived the life that we were supposed to live. He died the death that we were supposed to die. He was put in the bar tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. He come alive on the third day and as we begin to see this, 40 days later, he ascended back to the Father. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father waiting to make intercession in our life for anything that we might need. We can come only to the throne of grace when he died on the cross, that veil was that the temple was read from the top to the bottom. And as we begin to understand that, if we don't get healed, if we don't get a new car, if somebody don't put money in our hand, church, we are blessed. We are a blessed people because God has sent his son to die for us. And we can have assurance that we can spend eternity with him when we leave this world and have abundant life here. We are blessed. We give that song backwards. We sing that song. When the praises go up, the blessings come down. No, 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 no. The blessings already come down, church. The praises ought to stay up here. We ought to be praising Him every day when we get up. We ought not have to be pumped up to praise the Lord. We ought not have to have a worship leader to come in here and say, let's worship the Lord together. We ought to be pumped up because He did come down and humble Himself to death and die on the cross and stand at the right hand of the Father that we might have intercession right now, today, right at this very moment. We have been we have been bought with a price. We have been made when we join heirs with Christ Jesus. And if we can't get excited and praise Him about that, what are we going to praise Him for? Amen. And I think as we begin to really put our minds in gear about that, we only want to praise Him when we get something tangible, something monetary. We, we, we jack after it all up. But I think as we begin to understand that, praise is a big thing. And bless means that He came and He did that. One more thing that I really <clears throat> thought about there. He said, the Lord, <coughs> the Lord will bless thee and keep thee. Sometimes we want to seek the blessings. We want God to bless us. We want the blessings of God. But as soon as we get the blessings of God in the way that we think that they, are, they should be poured out, as soon as we get a, something happen in our life that we, we deem a blessing, you know what the first thing we want to do? We want to disconnect from the blessed earth. We want to say, oh yeah, I'm good for a while, God. I don't need to see you. I'll call you when I need something else. Think about that. I mean, that's how we do it. Sometimes when we, when we when things are going good, when the blessings of, of God is being in them blessings are flowing, then we disconnect from God. But if we really put that word in perspective, God has come down and that's the blessing. So when should there ever be a time that we can disconnect from God? Never. We're never to disconnect from Him. That's why the Bible says to bless thee and keep thee. The word keep means to, us to be connected to God. Here's the imagery. The imagery is the sheepfold at night. They would bring those sheep and they would put this protection around them, this hedge of protection. They would, they, they would have these, these, these fence, but they were made out of bushes and things like that. And they would corral these sheep into these, these, these sheepfolds at night. And as they would put them in there, <clears throat> this was a hedge of protection around them. Yes. And I think as we begin to understand that, we don't have to just look for that hedge of protection because God is that hedge of protection. He is the one that comes to protect us. He came down and humbled himself to death so that we can have that protection. Now, I just think that, you know, as we begin to look at this in verse 26, this is kind of the meaning of the verse here, but it says this. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Now, <clears throat> God has blessed us by coming down. And he is letting his face to shine upon us. He has fixed his face upon us to give us what? To give us peace. So that we can walk through this world. That we can navigate through life with the peace of God. Not, not fully understanding how God's going to work things out for us. But, in, a, in another sense, fully understanding that God will work these, these things out for us, even though we don't know how. It don't matter that I know not how He's going to do it. I don't even know. I don't have to know how God's going to do it. I just to know. I just need to know to trust Him that He will do it. Yeah. 
Yes. And I think as we see this, we begin to really understand this. So let's just kind of think about it for a moment. Back to the garden. Let's go back to the garden eating really quickly. What happened in the garden? When they realized they had eaten the forbidden fruit, what did they do? They ran and they hid. They turned their face away from God because it said God came walking in the cool of the day. He called them by name and he said, where are y'all? Where y'all at? And they said, we were hiding because we were afraid. We were naked. We were all this stuff, you know. Well, why are you hiding? Oh, y'all eating that tree, didn't you? Y'all eating the forbidden fruit. So I think as we begin to see this, they hid themselves in the garden, turned their face away. And ever since that day, humanity has been looking for the face of approval. And they're trying to find the face of approval in people. And they're trying to find the face of approval in other things. And they're trying to find approval in all these things of the world. And then here we are. We're trying to fix ourselves. We're trying to fix our situation. We're trying to fix the things that are broken in our life. And God says, that you will never fix yourself. But if you will fix your eyes on me, I'm your hope. I'm your joy. I'm your peace. As we see there in verse 26, since he says this, he said, he'll lift up his countenance upon thee and give you peace. That's where peace is going to come from. When we have fixed our face on God because his face it's always fixed on us. <clears throat> One more thing. Jesus on the cross. <clears throat> you remember that story we talked about a few weeks ago on Wednesday night. Here Jesus is hanging between the heaven and the earth. And he says these words. Eli, Eli, that was my God. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? As he began to drink that cup <clears throat> in the garden of Gethsemane, he was not <clears throat> concerned when he said, let this cup pass from me. He was not concerned about those nails that would be driven in his hand. He was not concerned about that spear that would be <clears throat> thrust into his side. What he was concerned about, he knew all things and he knew how it was going to play out. <clears throat> but what he was concerned about is that when he begins to absorb the sin death for my sin, your sin, sins of that day, and every sin that will be committed <clears throat> until he returns again. He knew that God could not look on sin. And he knew that there would be a disconnect. And he was dreading that day. And he said, God, if there's any other way. Now, I don't want to be disconnected from you because he was always in perfect unity with the Father. God, if there's any way. Not that this spirit could not thrust my side. Not that these nails could not pierce my hands and my feet. But God, if there's any way that, there, that you could avoid this disconnect. That's what I'm looking for. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And I think as we really begin to ponder upon that and we begin to think about that, we <clears throat> trust God and, and we say, God, I want you to fix my situation. And he said, fix your eyes on me. Trust me. And look. And I think as we begin to really understand that Jesus was forsaken of the Father on that cross for a short time there. As he hung between the heavens and the earth. He took that forsakenness. And he took that disconnect from God. And he allowed God to turn his face away from him. So that when he died on that cross and he gave up the ghost and he said, It is finished into thy hands I commit thy spirit. When he said those words, when he went <clears throat> and was placed in that bar tomb with Joseph of Arimathea arose on that third day, and he's alive and well today, we're ready to meet that need that's in our life. Here's the good news of that. Because he was forsaken, we'll never be forsaken. Amen. Because he <clears throat> because he did that, we can always be forgiven. Yes. We find hope in those scriptures. We find hope yes. in those words. And I just think that, you know, if we could just fix our eyes on God, and let him see the finished work of the cross. And look beyond our shortcomings. Look beyond our idiosyncrasies. Look beyond our insecurities. If we could just do that, then and only then will he bring hope to our heart, forgiveness to our spirit, and, and, and peace to our soul. Then and only then. I don't know where you're at this morning. I, I, I really just don't want you to be confused about lessons. I really want you to understand that no matter what we're up against, we're already been blessed. We've already been blessed. Well, you may be here this morning and you just say, well, you know, I, I need a blessing from God. Well, you've already been blessed, but you received that blessing. And that blessing comes when Jesus died on the cross. That blessing came through salvation. Now, if we begin to understand that, we begin to understand we have to receive that. 
It's not something that, <clears throat> you know, that we can buy. It's not something that we can inherit. It's something that we receive. It's a free gift. And if you hear this morning, you're struggling. You're looking for approval. You're looking for peace that surpasses all understanding. You're not going to find it in the face of people. You're not going to find it in the face of, of anyone in this world. Because, I mean, they may can offer us approval for a little bit. But we talked about it last Sunday. Sooner or later, as much as we may not want to, we'll all let each other down. And there's a little, there's a, there's a little bit of Judas in all of us that we talked about last Sunday. But here's the thing. <clears throat> no matter what, we serve a God that will never forsake us. We serve a God that always has His face fixed on us. And if we'll fix our face on Him, then and only then will He bring us joy and peace. I wonder where you're at this morning. If you got a need, these altars open. If you got a need, I want you to come and, and just trust the Lord this morning. Would you fix your face on Him? Because He's already looking at you. And as He looks out at this crowd this morning, don't no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, He's smiling today. And He's standing with open arms saying, Come, come. I'm fixing my face on you. Would you fix your face on me? And would you come? Would you trust me? Would you trust me with salvation? Would you trust me with the things and areas in your life that you've been really struggling with? Things that are keeping you awake at night. Would you trust me? I don't know where you're at this morning. Let's pray and ask God to meet us at our point of need. Father God, we thank you that we might be able to come before your throne of grace. And God, we come with great expectation because God, you did a perfect work on the cross when you sent your son Jesus to die. And we can have hope, we can have peace, and we can have salvation full and free. God, face one here that's never embraced you as Lord and Savior. Oh, what a wonderful day it would be for them to come and see your face today. And God, you will smile upon them. God, for that one that's looking for hope and peace and comfort in this world, and they, they've looked in all the wrong places. God, I pray that they'll fix their face on you today. And God, they'll see hope like they've never seen it. They'll see joy like they've never seen it. And they'll experience peace like they've never had it before. God, I don't know what your will is. I don't know what your desire is in this service this morning. But I know that, that you have a desire that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. And God, I pray you'll meet that need. And your desire and your default is to bless your people. And God, we thank you and praise you for that. And I pray your blessings will be poured out. If you've already poured out the greatest blessing we can experience by giving your son to die on the cross. But God, I pray that you'll let somebody experience that blessing of salvation this morning. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.